Get ready for one of the most exciting, most enjoyable teachings that I know I have ever done. If you want something that is content rich, it's coming your way. We're going to give you an overload on the Word of God. Stay tuned. John chapter 4. Now Jesus is into his ministry. It's begun. And uh, as it's begun, the tide has begun to shift. John prophesied it was going to shift. He said, I must decrease. He must increase. And that is happening. So Jesus is now drawing a lot of the crowds. And Jesus leaving one of the crowds makes this statement right here. And we're going to start at verse 3. But he needed to go through Samaria. I think the King James Version says it this way. I must needs go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near a plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. That's 12 o'clock during the day. <coughs> Pardon me. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone into the city to buy food. That's important. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. The racial tension right out of the gate. This is nothing new. It has plagued our nation for too long. And when a sickness has permeated several hundred years and is still here, then a run to CVS is usually not going to cure it. There's some type of surgery that needs to be done. That's what I'm trying to do in these eight or ten messages, do some surgery. So I'm asking you to stay, listen, let the Word of God penetrate your heart. Let it search your heart, okay? So Jesus answered and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who says you give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. You can hear the resentment. I'm going to tell you how this resentment got there in a moment. You can hear the tension in the conversation. You don't have, you can feel it as you read it, Okay. You have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where do you go to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, whoever drinks this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water I shall give him will become a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, sir, Give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said, go call your husband. Um, um, yeah, um, that's those times when God asks you those questions and you go, hey, um, okay. Uh, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. You've had five. And the one who is with you now is, we'll just call him a friend. You were, uh, excuse me, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Conversation shifts. <clears throat> Our fathers worshiped on this mountain and you Jews, listen to you Jews, you Jews. Just a, that's just a racial slur of the day. You Jew, you people, okay? You're not one of us, you people. You Jews say in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour's coming where you neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour's coming and is now coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So they continued to speak. Jesus said, I've heard about this Messiah. Verse 26, Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. Stay with me. At that point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, 
What do you seek or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water pot, went on her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Let's swip out, switch over and let's read on down to verse 35. Jesus looks at his disciples and he says this, do you not say there's still four months and then the harvest comes? Behold, I tell you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are white unto harvest. Lord, bless the reading of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Terrence. Give me a few minutes to deal with this story and to just break it down. <clears throat> Jesus has gained in popularity, and now he says, I've got to go to Samaria. The Jews did not go to Samaria. Uh, it was in direct route, but Jews normally went around it. So Jesus is saying, I'm dropping bombs already. He's saying, I've got to go to the place you won't go. <laughs> I've got to go to the place that you won't go. What is significant about this woman, Samaria, Samaritans, and this well? Let me give you some context. In, in context, in 722 B.C., because of the judgment of God on Israel, Assyria invaded Israel. And many of the Assyrians, after Israel was invaded and overthrown, they stayed in Israel and they intermarried the Assyrians with the Israelites. These people evolved and were known by this time as Samaritans. The Jews did not like them because the Jews felt like they had sold out to another race of people, invaders of their homeland. So the Samaritans resented the fact that the Jews looked down on them. The Jews felt like they were superior to them. Many of these things which we claim in the racial tensions that are going on today was going on right here in John chapter 4. So you had these people called Samaritans. They're only mentioned a few times in the Bible. Uh, we know that Jesus one day said, who is my neighbor? Excuse me, he was asked, who is my neighbor? And Jesus told the story of what we call the Good Samaritan. He talked about uh, the Jew that walked by, the Levite who walked by, all of those that walked by and passed the man who was beaten and left for dead. But a Samaritan stopped and we talk about him as the good Samaritan. If there's a good Samaritan, that must mean that there are some not so good Samaritans. So here again, this was a Samaritan that happened to be good. In other words, they thought most of them to be bad. So when they talked about a Samaritan, they said, oh, we found a good one. Here again, racial tension. There was one place where the Samaritans were even called dogs. So we see consistently throughout the Bible that Jesus was constantly having to build a bridge between the Jews and everybody that the Jews did not want to associate with. So Jesus set up this encounter. Listen, set up an encounter. We're in John chapter four. We got many chapters to go. Right out of the gate to build a bridge between two ethnicities who did not like each other, resented each other, the Jews did not like the Samaritans, the Samaritans did not like the Jews. Now, let's look at Jesus' strategy. Number one, Jesus came to her. Another thing, Jesus made sure that the rest of them had gone to town to buy food. Whew, I don't almost stand my seat. Jesus had a band of 12 super Jews. Jesus must have known that this encounter could not take place and not succeed in their presence. So there was something that was going to have to be done and be a finished work by the time they got back because it could not progress in their presence because there, were so, there was so much tension, so much ethnic tension, and so many prejudices that went between the Jews and the Samaritan. Jesus would have had little success if they would have stayed with the journey. So they go into town to buy food. I am told by the resources I looked at, this was a five-mile journey for food. So it's five miles to get the food and five-mile walk back. So they're on a 10-mile journey to 
get something to walk. So Jesus has given himself a good span of time to set up this encounter where he's got to build a bridge between two people who do not like each other. Anybody who thinks that the gospel stays in church and doesn't get outside the church and build a bridge to its brother, you have not read the Bible that I'm reading. And not only that, but Jesus especially gave his ministry and his time and his effort always to the disenfranchised. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He said, in other words, I leave the 99 and go get the one. Jesus would leave the crowd of church people who were shouting him down while he preached and go across the sea and go to an island where a man is bound in chains and demon possessed. So he was willing to leave the crowd and go get the demon possessed, willing to go and minister to the poor, willing to go and minister to the lame, willing to go and make sure that they had bread, make sure they had fish to eat, make sure he fed the hungry. There is no way way you can read this book and tell me that Jesus didn't on purpose, consciously, intentionally move toward the disenfranchised in the society. So whatever my nature is determines my desires. Whatever I desire determines my actions. God's People, a new series from Ron Carpenter addressing a biblical response to racism. You'll learn how in God's kingdom, we are all equal. Why has God asked us to do godly things? Because he knows what's in us and he knows what we can do. And it's time for Christ to be formed inside the body and us to grow on the inside with that which we've been born with us. Away from being a seed, 10, 20, 30 years. It's time to walk in the fullness of the expression of being spirit-filled men and women of God. Greater works shall we do because he went to the Father. This nine message series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we'll include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen. So you can't preach a true gospel and leave the fact that Jesus wanted to go around and show equity to everybody, place value on everybody, and that there was no pecking order to Jesus. Jesus immediately got out of his Jewishness to go reach a woman who the Jews looked down on even though he was a Jew himself. This is good stuff. He came to her. What side of town do you ignore? Who are you never willing to enter in a conversation with? Have you ever sat down to find out what anybody's life is like besides yours? Do you ever listen or do you always do the talking? Come on, stay with me. Don't get mad at me. Have you ever thought about the fact that somebody didn't have it like you had it? Have you ever thought about the fact somebody does not see the world like you see it? That you have been framed by many of your experiences and you see the world through those experiences and if your experiences have been mostly positive and you were raised in a positive environment, you were raised in a positive home life, you tend to look at the world through a positive viewpoint and vantage point. But there are others who have not shared those positive experiences and they have a different set of needs but look, everybody's got a come to the well because I don't care if you're rich, poor, I don't care if you're up, down, I don't care what side of town, railroad tracks, educated, uneducated, or what color your skin is, everybody's got to come to the well for something because everybody's thirsty for something. So not only did Jesus get out of his comfort zone, not only did he remove himself from the crowd who would not take lightly to this encounter, that's important, I ain't got time to mess with that, that's a whole different conversation. But then he immediately met at common ground, went to her, got rid of the crowd that would impeded the encounter, and third, he went to common ground. A well. One, things the Jews, one thing the Jews and the Samaritans shared is that the Jews loved Jacob. The Samaritans also claimed Jacob to be their father. Jacob had dug that well and left it to his son Joseph. So the Jews did not like Samaritans. Samaritans did not like Jews, but both of them loved Jacob. And that was the well that they all had to come to to draw from. 
So notice right here, I do not believe it's an accident that Jesus met them at the place of common ground. In other words, he said, I'm not going to come to debate our differences. I'm going to come and share in our likeness. What do we both need? I'm thirsty, you're thirsty. You love Jacob, I love Jacob. We both have access to this well and we both need a drink. When are we going to come together out of commonalities instead of finding a place where we're different? Don't try to find a word that I have missaid. Don't try to find where I've misspoke. Find where I've spoke in the right place, not where I've screwed it up. Find where I did the right thing, not where I've made a mistake. We're waiting for somebody to mess up. We're waiting for somebody to offend us. And I'm asking you, let's come to Jacob's well. You need something from the well. I need, I got to preach. I need something from the well. We're both thirsty. Maybe you're thirsty from loneliness. Maybe I'm thirsty because I've been dealing with a sickness. Maybe Maybe you're thirsty because you just went through a divorce. Maybe I'm thirsty because I got a son on drugs. But everybody needs to come to the well for some reason. And it's time that we find our common ground because I guarantee you there are more things and more places where we are alike than there are when we are different. It's just a matter of focus. I can focus on the thing that takes away the bridge or I can focus on the thing that builds a bridge. The choice is mine and the choice is yours. And I'm I'm asking, can we be like Jesus and come to a well and drink out of common ground? Whoo, I'm about to shout myself down. I picked a hard one to sit down on. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> so they come to common ground. He shows up there. She immediately says, you Jews, she recognizes he's a Jew and knows that he's being abnormally kinder. You have no idea how much kindness goes toward healing something. I don't believe any of the rest of this encounter would not have happened if it had not have started with simple kindness. The fruit of the Spirit is kindness. Can you just say something kind? Can you just be kind? Can you have a nice touch? Can you have a nice word? Can you have a nice expression? Can you place value on? And he did that. And so his kindness began to lower her guard down. It's an amazing thing that if you extend love first, they'll listen to your theology later. If you would let me say it this way, Jesus practiced his sociology of his life before he taught her the theology of his life. We want to go in teaching what we know and challenging each other on where they're wrong. Jesus went with an outstretched hand and just started a conversation. And I don't know who this man is. I don't know he's the Messiah. I don't know he's the Christ. I just know he's a nice man. So he reaches out in kindness. That's four things. Came, come to where she is, got rid of the crowd that would have impeded the encounter, met on common ground, and started out building a bridge of kindness before he taught anything. I got my notes written down here. I'm going to keep reading away. Look right here. You have answered right. You spoke truly. The woman said, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain and you Jews say Jerusalem is the place. Up until this point, Jesus has let every you Jew comment go. He let it go. Every time she took a punch, you have no dealing with us. You Jews don't like us Samaritans. The well is deep. You have no, I mean, just, she just keeps, he lets them all go. But when she brings up father, he doesn't let that go. This is very important. I would say this is the crux of my message. Because we're starting off with kindness and we're getting to the problem. I can't get to the problem by being mean and ugly and nasty and having a bad spirit. I only get to the problem through kindness. But Jesus is now at the root of the problem and she brings it up, not him. Our fathers told us. Our fathers told us that we're supposed to worship this mountain, Mount Gerizim. We're supposed to worship. In other words, we can't encounter God 
And we can't learn about God and we can't experience God if we don't come here. And Jesus responds like this right here. This is powerful. He says, you worship what you do not know. Woo. You worship what you know not. Here is the, here's one of these places where I'm going to start challenging us and we're going to have to take these challenge and challenge ourselves. Look what's going on here. Jesus said, you have been taught wrong. I'm sorry if it was your daddy. I'm sorry if it was your granddaddy. I'm sorry if it was your daddy, your great, your, your great, your granddaddy, your great granddaddy. Let's go back as far as you want to go. I don't care who started this Mount Gerizim thing, but you have been taught wrong. You are coming to the wrong place to get God. God is not here. And your daddy taught you that. And you are coming to this well and you're worshiping at this mountain because of something you were told. Woo! Help me, Holy Ghost. Could it be, could it be that people you believed in and trusted in taught you something that you have abided by up to this point that is not true. Jesus, <laughs> this woman based her whole God experience on coming to that mountain and Jesus ripped it apart in one word. Your daddy taught you wrong. Racism is learned. It is not innate. It is not in the blood. An old statement that is not original with me, there are no racists in the baby ward at the hospital. It is something that is a learned way of thinking. It is a learned prejudice. It is a learned response. And then it becomes a learned function. This woman is acting out worship coming to a place of worship, there's no telling the amount of time and energy been spent living a lie. If you believe a lie, you live a lie. And sometimes we've been taught to hate people that the whole time God viewed as your brother and as your sister. And it is a learned response. He got stern with her. He called her woman. He said, woman, I'm not going to let this one go. I've let all the other ones go. But the fact is, you worship what you don't know. Let me tell you what the Father is really looking for. He's not looking for Mount Gerizim, and he's not even looking for Jerusalem. He's looking for people who worship him in spirit and truth. He's looking for people who come at him out of a passion in their heart and who have a standard. Truth is a standard. Heart is the bedrock of your passion, of your person. He says God wants you to have a standard of worship and God wants you to do it passionately from the inside out, not outside in like a form of religion, but inside out because you are connected to the one whom you're worshiping. So whatever my nature is determines my desires. Whatever I desire determines my action. God's People, a new series from Ron Carpenter addressing a biblical response to racism. You'll learn how in God's kingdom we are all equal. Why has God asked us to do godly things? Because He knows what's in us and He knows what we can do. And it's time for Christ to be formed inside the body and us to grow on the inside with that which we've been born with us. Away from being a seed 10, 20, 30 years. It's time to walk in the fullness of the expression of being spirit-filled men and women of God. Greater works shall we do because He went to the Father. This nine message series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we'll include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen.
just let me start by saying thank you for watching. I'm, I'm glad you're here. And I hope that you're benefiting from it. I really do. I hope that maybe uh, you feel like something in your mind's being rearranged, sometimes your theology's being challenged. Those are good things uh, to make sure that we're never in a rut in our thinking. So thank you so much for being with us, and I hope that it's being fruitful in your life. Uh, this is the time where we just want to invite you to go deeper. You know what? I invite you to visit our website, roncarpenter.com. If you'd like to know what's going on and how you can be a part of our ongoing life and ministry. And not only that, but if you'd like to get to know us deeper, go to one of our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We're doing stuff all the time, prophetic words, scriptures God's laid on my heart, teachings, words of encouragement, leadership stuff, a prayer. There's no telling what we may do. So if you're enjoying this a little bit once or so a week, we're doing that every day. Maybe there's something in there that can help you and I'd love to see you. And now we've come to that final but very big part where we want to say thank you to those that give and challenge others to be a part of this wonderful giving community. Notice that we did not break for any commercial. We didn't go and try to sell you any other products. Why? Because we are totally and completely viewer supported. And it takes resources to go to the whole earth. It takes highly skilled people it takes people with a lot of knowledge. It takes engineers. It takes high-level equipment. It takes buying time. I used to, I'm going to be honest with you, be somewhat critical of TV preachers in their plea for fundraising until I became a TV preacher, and I realized all that it went into it. It's hard to take the world if you don't have the resources to take the world. You have helped us get from a small camcorder in a small metal warehouse to covering much of the footprint of the earth today. For that I'm grateful. And our next challenge is to not just get to the whole earth, but to get to the whole earth in as many, much of its known la native languages as possible. That's our next endeavor. Huge challenge, but I believe it can be done. Would you help us? Those that have been giving, thank you. We couldn't have done it without you. And those that say, you know what? This has blessed me. I'd like to give. Whether it's one time, you can give a one-time gift, or you can become a part of this continual giving family that keeps us on the air called our covenant partnership. Either way, for your first gift, we're gonna send you this to say thank you. I am so grateful, humbled and blessed that you would find this soil to be rich enough and worthy of the seed that you sow and the gift that you invest. We're so grateful for that. I can't wait to see what God's gonna do next as we delve deeper in this. It's gonna be several weeks stretched out. So make sure you don't miss it, record it, do whatever you got to do, but don't miss it. Until then, blessings. I'll see you soon. Join us every week for another exciting message from Ron Carpenter. And until then, visit us online at roncarpenter.com and discover encouraging resources to help you reach your greatest potential in your Christian walk. And when you visit, consider partnering with our ministry team to help us take this life-changing message to the world. Our goal is to take the message and ministry of Ron Carpenter to a worldwide audience, but we can only do it with your help. And don't forget to connect with Ron every day through social media. Thank you so much for being a part of this ministry. And we'll see you again next time for another challenging message with Ron Carpenter.